Good evening. Good evening and uh, welcome everybody. My name is Irena Grudzińska Gross and I welcome you uh, on behalf of the Institute for Human Sciences at the Boston University. We are, as uh, many of you who come to our uh, events know, we are very much interested, among other things, in presenting European issues and Europeans, European thinkers. And uh, Slavoj Zizek is definitely a European thinker, but also a global thinker or international thinker or kind of a flying public intellectual. So we are very, very happy and very lucky to have him this evening with us. Uh, I am not going to introduce him. Uh, the, Professor Jeffrey Merman is going to, to introduce him. Professor Jeffrey Mer Merman, as also many of you know, is pro university professor and professor of French at Boston University. Uh, his uh, list of publications is very long. Among his many interests, uh, he's also interested in uh, philosophy and in Lacan, uh, and many of his interests are shared with uh, Slavoj Zizek. We are going to have this introduction, then uh, Slavoj Zizek is going to talk. After that, we will have a, a discussion, and I will ask everybody to queue here. We have a microphone and, uh, and to, to ask questions. And after the discussion, so that the conversation is not interrupted and it continues, we are going to have a very uh, warm and wonderful reception outside uh, outside the doors here, to which everybody is very cordially invited. So let's start, and Professor Merman. Well, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to welcome our speaker, Slavoj Zizek, uh, back to Boston uh, this evening. Uh, where to begin? Uh, well, when in the year 1975, the editors of a volume entitled in French, The Technical Writings of Freud, by the arcane French psychoanalyst Lacan, when they chose as their cover illustration a photo of a giant elephant poised to rampage through the savanna, the message to many of us was clear. When it comes to the unconscious, be prepared for absolutely anything. Uh, or perhaps, uh, that implausibility or preposterousness themselves are the touchstones of the unconscious. Now, be that as it may, I am not sure that any of us were prepared for anything so implausible, so engagingly traumatic as the revelation some 15 years later that the future of Lacanian thought would lie with a Slovenian, uh, Slovenian enough to have run for the presidency of the Republic of Slovenia and prepared to argue convincingly that the royal road to the Lacanian interpretation of the unconscious was via American popular culture. Uh, just savor the title of his 1993 volume, Everything You Wanted to Know, You Always Wanted to Know about Lacan, but were afraid to ask Hitch Hitchcock, and you'll have a sense of the irresistibility of the Zizek effect. Uh, Slavo Zizek is the world's premier virtuoso of Lacanian dogmatics. Lest that term dogmatics throw you, I would suggest that you think of it as an invitation to bracket the truth claims uh, of his premises in all of their systematicity until you are in a position to judge the rollicking richness of the results they can deliver. With Zizek, psychoanalysis so often decried for failing to meet the test of falsifiability, psychoanalysis frequently ends up yielding results which in their paradoxical uh, charge might de be described as better than true. He is the thinker who has dealt most ingeniously with the joker in the Lacanian pack, the category of the real. He's also the thinker who has delivered us a superego drenched in its obscenely libidinal sources as it originally was in Freud's The Rat Man, that is, the superego, not as venerable patriarch, if you will, but as dirty old man, replete with the stained underwear of Hermann Kafka, that's Francis' dad. He has also made use of Lacan, as he has somewhere written, as a privileged intellectual tool to reactualize 
German idealism. So Lacan, whose inspiration was in part the legendary seminar on Hegel of Kozhev in the 1930s, seems headed via Zizek through a series of altogether unexpected turns back to Hegel and company. Well, I could go on listing the tens of provocatively titled volumes he has written. The next is to be, I believe, called In Defense of Lost Causes. I could go on mentioning his current position as director of the Birkbeck Institute uh, for the Humanities at Birkbeck College, University of London. <clears throat> I could go on letting you know of the recently founded online International Journal of Zizek Studies, or of the documentary film Zizek, that's right, with an exclamation mark. I leave you instead with one piquant detail. My sources tell me that there is currently a chic nightclub in a Tony section of Buenos Aires named, you guessed it, Zizek. Please welcome our speaker, whose subject this evening is uh, Fear Thy Neighbor as Thyself, the Antinomies of Tolerant Reason. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for Irena to inviting me, for Jeffrey for this wonderful introduction. I especially agree without any irony with that very precise point about dogmatics. I think that, and especially I would even go a step further and say dogmatics in the theological sense in the word. Why? Maybe it will become clear from what I will be saying. So let me go to the point. And, but nonetheless, I hope you will not be too disappointed because there w it will not be only jokes in what I will be <laughs> saying. Okay, let me begin in a very traditional way with a big question. What can philosophy do today? What can it tell the general public haunted by the problems of ecology, racism, religious conflicts, and so on? I think that the task of philosophy is not to provide answers, but to show how the way we perceive a problem can be itself part of a problem, mystifying it instead of enabling us to solve it. There are not only wrong answers, there are also wrong questions. These wrong questions are what we call ideology. When we are dealing with a problem, which is undoubtedly a real problem, the ideological designation or perception introduces its inevitable mystification. So again, when people ask me ecology or war, what can we do? Well, I don't know. What I can do as a philosopher is just to analyze how we perceive the problem. Let me take the example of tolerance. I'm opposed to this notion. I think it's a pseudo notion. Now, of course, the immediate reaction of well-meaning liberals is, but how can you be for intolerance towards foreigners? How can you be for anti-feminism, for homophobia, and so on and so on? But this is the catch. Of course, I'm not for intolerance towards foreigners, for anti-feminism, and so on. What I am against is the perception, which is today more or less automatic, of racism as a problem of tolerance. Make a simple experiment. I did make it. Go and check on the web Martin Luther King's speeches. If there is a great figure of anti-racist fight, of course, it's Ma Martin Luther King. You will see that the word Intolerance is practically absent there. For Martin Luther King, one doesn't fight racism with tolerance, but with what? Emancipatory political struggle, even armed struggle. So why are so many problems today perceived as problems of intolerance rather than problems of inequality, exploitation, injustice, and so on? You see my point? That's for me the problem. Racism is a problem. But to perceive racism as problem of tolerance, it's not automatic. In this innocent shift of perspective, there is ideology. Why? I claim the reason is the liberal multiculturalist basic ideological operation, the, let's call it, culturalization of politics. 
political differences, differences conditioned by political inequality or economic exploitation, are naturalized, neutralized into cultural differences. That is, into different ways of life, which are something given, something that cannot be overcome, so they can only be tolerated. The cause of this culturalization is the retreat, the failure of direct political solutions such as welfare state or various socialist projects. Tolerance is their post-political ersatz. And I think the same goes for harassment, another heavily connotated ideological term. Again, of course, I am very much against brutal harassments like rape, bigotry, and so on and so on. The problem is that in today's ideological space, real harassments, their perception, is irreducibly intertwined with the narcissistic notion of an individual who experiences all proximity of others as an intrusion into his or her private space. So I claim that the way we, in the so-called highly developed Western countries, if you look closely how we effectively use the word tolerance, I claim it de facto as a rule means its exact opposite. Tolerance means don't harass me. Don't harass me means don't come too close to me. You know, like, are you washed, desodorants, don't smoke. And in other words, tolerance means I am intolerant towards your over proximity to me. Tolerance means don't come too close, stay, stay at the proper distance. So ideology is in this precise sense, a notion which while designating a real problem, blurs a crucial line of separation. Okay, another of such classical ideological notions today, I think, is this celebration pseudo delusion of nomadic existence and so on and so on. Why? Because instead of enabling us to draw the crucial distinction, it blurs it. It brings together, under the same cover, nomadic existence, two totally different phenomena. One is the nomadic existence of, well, to be frank, somebody like me, and probably upper middle class intellectual, traveling nicely, sometimes with upgrades and so on, even business class. <laughs> but then, you know, to put me together with, let's say, to be a little bit pathetic, a third world person, refugee from a war-torn or starved kind or starved population and claim we are both nomadic. It's a little bit like, to quote Gayatri Spivak, to take a rich, fat lady who is dieting and a starving third world woman and say they are basically doing the same thing, eat, eating less than. Uh, this ideology of tolerance can be reduced to the motto, love your neighbor as yourself. However, as we learned from Freud, neighbor is not simply another person with a rich inner life filled with stories she or he is telling himself, herself. This is the counter-revolution attacks <laughs> or what? <laughs> Enemy never. You see? I told, okay. This is what in Lacan we call intervention of the real and so on. Okay, <laughs> let's go on. It's, uh, so uh, usually when we say neighbor, Multiculturalist ideology tells us, yes, we should know the other from within. We should not objectivize the other. Uh, the premise of liberal tolerance is thus that uh, such a person whom we know from within cannot ultimately be an enemy. Or to quote a well-known motto, which I totally oppose, incidentally, and, but it sounds so sublime, so deep. An enemy is someone whose story you have not heard. Okay, there is a nice literary example known to all of us, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. It is true, Mary Shelley does something that a conservative would never have done. In the central part of her, part of her novel, she allows the monster to speak for himself, to tell the story from his own perspective. Her choice expresses the liberal attitude towards the freedom of speech at its most radical. Everyone's point of view should be heard. In Frankenstein, the monster is not a thing, a horrible object no one dares to confront. He is fully subjectivized. Mary Shelley moves inside his mind and asks, what is it like to be labeled, defined, oppressed, excommunicated, even physically distorted by society? 
The ultimate criminal is thus allowed to present himself as the ultimate victim. The monstrous murderer reveals himself as a deeply hurt, hurt, desperate individual yearning for company and love. Now, along these lines, practicing this noble motto of multicultural tolerance, the authorities in Iceland, Iceland, Reykjavik capital, but also now I heard in some other European countries, maybe even here in the United States, I don't know about it, they are recently imposing a unique form of enacting this subjectivization of the other. In order to fight the growing xenophobia, the result of the greater and greater number of immigrant workers in Western Europe, as well as sexual intolerance, they are organizing what is called living libraries. Members of ethnic or sexual minorities, gays, immigrant East Europeans or blacks, are paid to visit an Iceland or British or German family and just talk to them, acquainting them with their way of life, their everyday practices, their dreams, and so on. In this way, the exotic stranger who was perceived as a threat to our way of life appears as somebody we can empathize with, with a complex world of his or her own. So this sounds very nice. What's the problem? The problem is, let's take this noble motto, uh, an enemy is someone whose story you have not heard, and do something very vulgar in the sense of British empiricism. Let's just replace the general name with a concrete example. Would you also say Hitler was our enemy because we did not really try to hear his story? And the problem is deeper here than it may, uh, than it may appear. Namely, the automatic presupposition which we should abandon is that the story we are telling ourselves about ourselves, our inner authentic self-experience is the point of truth. As if, if you humanize the other, if you get him at his or her or their innermost, then you can say this is what they truly are. But I think that this precisely, if there is a lesson of psychoanalysis, is that this precisely is what we should radically abandon. Uh, if from what we know about Hitler, if we take again the worst example, one of the worst, Hitler, I think that even for him probably, the same as Hannah Arendt claimed for Eichmann would have hold. Probably he was, as we know from the memories of his secretary who died only two years ago or when, he, was, he could have been quite kind, compassionate, he liked to serve cakes to small children and so on, gentle vegetarian and so on. <coughs> and I'm even quite sure that, that he was absolutely sincere in this. This is the important lesson of Hannah Arendt, uh, that people who cause great evil, we should not elevate them into sublime, Byronesque, demoniac figures of evil. The gap between their intimate experience and the horror of their acts is always immense. So again, the experience we have of our lives from within, the story we tell ourselves about ourselves in order to account for what we are doing is fundamentally a lie. That's not the point of truth. So let me give you two extreme examples which I already developed in some of my earlier books. One Western, one Eastern. The West, Per Joseph. You maybe know who he was, the great eminence of Cardinal Richelieu. And you should maybe read the book Aldous Huxley, The Great Eminence, about Per Joseph. What fascinated Aldous Huxley so much about Per Joseph? It's that he was, well, the most brutal real political Poli real politiker, real politician that you can imagine, organizing kidnappings, torture, dark plotting. He's basically the guy, if we simplify history, who is responsible for Hitler. You know, in one sense, in the Thirty Years' War, 1918, 19, uh, sorry, 16, 18, 16, 48, in Europe, he was the one who made a pact between Catholic France and Protestant Sweden against, okay, uh, Catholic. Austria, in order to weaken Germany, to prevent the reunification of Germany. He succeeded. The result was the German delay, deferral of reunification, which 
was the structural condition for Hitler. Okay, the worst guy you can imagine. But there is something quite fascinating. After he did this dirty work every evening, metaphorically, almost every evening, he was in permanent uh, conversation, exchange of letters with some uh, French uh, 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 convent where with uh, nuns. And the exchange of letter demonstrates that he was a practicing uh, mystic, the same Père Joseph, and you cannot escape the conclusion. His mystical meditations are, how, how should I put it simply, top of the top, absolutely at the level of St. Teresa of whatever you want. And this is what fascinated Huxley. How is it possible that the same person who was ruthless, lying, poisoning, brutality itself, at the same time demonstrates a breathtakingly deep spiritual <coughs> strength. Huxley's solution was a very simple one, was that there must be something in Western Christianity which enables this, opens up the possibility of this deviation. He thinks it's too much fixation on pain, fascination with the figure of Christ on the cross. So Huxley's solution, let's turn to Eastern spirituality. But there, I think, the story is the same. I read a book which I often quote, uh, Brian Victoria, he himself is a Zen Buddhist, Zen at War, where you learn again. Th this is a book about how the Japanese Zen community related towards the Japanese war effort in the 30s and 40s. And you learn in this book that with really a couple, like five, six minor exceptions, millions of them not only totally supported Japanese war effort, but even provided the justification of it. Let me mention a figure which I'm sure is well known to many of you, Daisy Teitaro Suzuki, popular in the 60s here in the States and in all Europe as the great popularizer of Zen Buddhism. Maybe we should also read his text from the 30s and 40s, where, for example, in justifying Japanese invasion of China, he said that the Chinese should learn that from the cosmic perspective, the sword which is killing them now is really a sword of love. <laughs> then uh, he advises the attitude of a true warrior, that you should, as it were, overcome your ego and objectivize yourself, which makes killing much easier. He says, like, when you kill a man, you shouldn't think I'm pulling the trigger to hit him. You should say, I'm observing how my hand triggers a gun, and when the bullet flows through the air, the enemy body stumbles upon it so that instead of a substantial confrontation of me hurting another human being, you get some kind of a abstract, abstract ballet. So even more, Suzuki and others, if you want detailed proofs, read the book, demonstrate how, uh, he demonstrates how uh, 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 yes, Suzuki even went a step further and claimed a very direct claim that for or the majority of ordinary people who don't have time for big meditations and so on and so on uh, to spend uh, days on them or years, uh, absolute obedience to military discipline is the only practical way to achieve Satori, the Zen Buddhist enlightenment. The idea is when the commander shouts, shoot, and you shoot without thinking, you have overcome your false ego, and so on, and so on, and so on. So again, my point is not, look, Suzuki was a dirty militarist in reality. No, this would have been easy. My point is, you got my point, to, to accept this gap, that at the same time, he could have justified terrible crimes, and at the same time, he was, he was absolutely authentic authentic purveyor of spiritual experiences. So, the lesson is clear. It concerns the difficulty to fully accept the gap between the inner authenticity of one's life and the ethics one practices. Inner authenticity is no guarantee against ethical monstrosity. Let me engage now with a much more problematic, maybe to some of you, example, which I mean in with whole respect towards the victims, of course. When the United 93 plane flight on September 11th and other three planes were kidnapped, it is significant that, that 
uh, the focus of the phone calls to their closest relatives from the passengers when, who knew they were about to die was always something like, I love you. However, a suspicion remains here. Is this desperate confession of love also not something of a sham? The same kind of fakery as the sudden turn to God and prayer of someone who suddenly faces the danger or proximity of death. In other words, you know, I'm talking now about a very desperate moment. They knew they were dying. You make the last call to your wife, beloved, whatever, I love you. But I claim, why should this be authentic? There is no reason to think, to think this is authentic. Uh, Another example came to my mind, which is known to every old United States leftist. I remember when I was young, we were all taught the horror about uh, the uh, Rosenberg trials, you know, against the two of them, Julius Ittel Rosenberg, accused of spying for Soviet Union. And we were fascinated by when their le prison letters were trans, like this sincerity, this purity. Even their advocates have to admit, today we know that, Maybe not both of them, but he, Julius. I'm sorry, we have to concede here to the devil, the right, when they are right. Uh, he was a spy. He was a spy. So this makes all the more crazy this, as it were, uh, moral, as it were, moral naivety, purity, how he was able to insist in his lie to the end. So I think that even when we are in this kind of a desperate situation, now I know I'm going to die. I don't think we are authentic at that point. At that point, we desperately construct a lie the way we would like to be remembered and so on and so on. You know what would have been a truly radical ethical act here for me? Please don't take it in an obscene way. I mean it deadly seriously. Let's say I'm on a plane. Of course, this only holds if it's true, the implication. The, the true act would have been, okay, I'm on a plane. I have a chance to call my wife. I know in two minutes I will be dead. To call my wife and to say, listen, darling, in, in, in half a minute I will die, but frankly, our marriage was hell, I'm glad, and so on. <laughs> that would have been an act. That would have been something. Do you know, to avoid this search, oh my God, now I must patch things up, and so on. At that point, to assert, that would have been something. And incidentally, I'm thinking maybe even it would have been humanly the best thing. Certainly for the wife, it would have been easier to forget you in this way. <laughs> Recall another tragic figure which really fascinated me from the Cold War era. Those Western leftists who heroically defied anti-communist hysteria in their own countries with the utmost sincerity. They were even ready to go to prison for their communist conviction and defense of Soviet Union. Like I now read a biography of, you know, the great black singer uh, Paul Robeson, who was up to the end, total defender of Soviet Union. Isn't it the very illusory nature of their belief which makes their subjective stance so tragically sublime? The miserable reality of the Stalinist Soviet Union makes the inner fragile beauty of their conviction all the more sublime. This leads us to an unexpected radical conclusion. It is not enough to say that we are dealing here with a tragically misplaced ethical conviction, with a blind trust that avoids confronting the miserable, terrifying reality of its point of reference. What if, on the contrary, such a blindness, such a violent gesture of exclusion, of refusing to see, such a disavowal of reality, such a fetishist attitude of, I know very well that things are horrible in the Soviet Union, but I nonetheless believe in Soviet socialism, is an innermost constituent of every ethical stance. Immanuel Kant was already aware of this paradox when he deployed his notion of enthusiasm apropos uh, the French Revolution in his late writing, Conflict of Faculties. According to Kant, the revolutions, French revolutions, true significance does not reside in what actually went on in Paris, much of which Kant was the first to concede was terrifying and included outbursts of murderous passion, but in the enthusiastic response 
that the events in Paris generated in the eyes of sympathetic observers all around Europe. A quote from Kant. The recent revolution of a people which is rich in spirit may well either fail or succeed, accumulate misery and atrocity. It nevertheless arouses in the heart of all spectators a taking of sights according to desires which borders on enthusiasm and which, since its very expression was not without danger, can only have been caused by a moral disposition within the human race." End of quote. So, to translate this into Lacanian language, the real event, the dimension of the real, did not reside in the immediate reality of the violent events in Paris, but in how this reality appeared to observers and in the hopes thus awakened in them. The reality of what went on in Paris belongs to the temporal dimension of empirical history. The sublime image that generated enthusiasm belongs to eternity. And mutatis mutandis, I claim, does the same not apply to the Western admirers of the Soviet Union? The Soviet experience of building socialism in one country certainly did, to quote Kant, accumulate misery and atrocity, but it nevertheless aroused enthusiasm in the heart of the spectators who were not themselves caught up in it. The question here is, does every ethics have to rely on such a gesture of fetishist disavowal, of such a, I don't want to see something as a condition of my sublime ethical enthusiasm? I think, yes, every ethics, with the exception of the ethics of psychoanalysis. To wonder at this fact is not a proper philosophical attitude. That is to say, what if that which appears as an inconsistency, as the failure to draw all the consequences from one's ethical attitude, what if this is, on the contrary, the positive condition of possibility of ethics? What if such an exclusion of some form of otherness from the scope of our ethical concerns is co-substantial with the very founding gesture of ethical universality, so that the more universal our ethics is, the more brutal the underlying exclusion is. What the Christian all-inclusive attitude, St. Paul's famous, there are no men or women, no Jew or Greeks for me, what this attitude involves is a radical exclusion of those who do not accept inclusion into the Christian community. In other particularistic religions, even in Islam, there is a place for others. They are tolerated even if they are looked upon with condescension. The Christian motto, all men are brothers, however, also means that those who do not accept to be my brothers are not men. In the early years of the Iranian revolution, Khomeini played on the same paradox when he claimed, I remember it plastically even now, in an interview for the Western press that the Iranian revolution is the most human in the entire history. Not one person was killed, he claimed, in the Iranian revolution. When the surprised journalist asked him about the death penalties publicized in the very Iranian media, Khomeini calmly replied, those that we killed were not men but criminal dogs. I think this logic is somehow implied by every ethical universalism. So what then does ethical universality exclude? Which dimension? There is a wonderful passage in Marcel Proust's a research in search of the lost time, in which Marcel, the figure in the novel, uses phone for the first time, speaking to his grandmother. Her voice, heard alone, apart from her body, surprised, surprises Marcel. It is a voice of a frail old woman, not the gentle voice of the grandmother he remembers. And the point is that this experience then colors his entire perception of the grandmother. When later, he visits her in person, he perceives her in a new way, as a strange, mad old woman, drowsing over her book, overburdened with age, flushed, coarse, vulgar, no longer the charming, caring grandmother he remembered. This is how voice as autonomous partial object can affect our entire perception of the body to which it belongs. The lesson of this is that precisely the direct experience of the unity of a person, where voice seems to fit its organic whole, involves 
a necessary mystification. In order to penetrate to the truth of the person, one has to tear this unity apart, to focus on one of its aspects in its isolation, and then to allow this element to color our entire perception. This is what Freud, I think, meant when he opposed hermeneutics, when he wrote that one should interpret on the tie, not on mass. To locate every feature of a human being into the totality of the person is to miss not only the meaning of this detail, but the true meaning of the whole itself. This is a very radical lesson of psychoanalysis, I, I think, that if I want really to understand you, no, I shouldn't see you as a whole person. I should do something like what Marcel experiences there. Isolate one feature where, when I isolate this feature, I see the vulgarity, the whatever, and then let this feature color all of it. And to put it in, back to Lacan, Lacanian terms, the, or even theological terms, in this way I pass from <laughs> neighbor in the simple sense of semblant, of one who is like me, to the neighbor in this more radical dimension. This would be maybe, for psychoanalysis, the, the, the expression of a neighbor. There is some, someone whom you think you know him or her perfectly, person with whom you spent decades and so on. But doesn't it often happen that, that at a certain point this person does something, you catch an evil gaze, a nervous gesture, of, uh, some vulgarity, unexpected brutality, and all of a sudden you ask yourself, my God, is this really the person that I knew? At that point you encounter the neighbor. So when Freud and Lacan insist on the problematic nature of the Judeo-Christian injunction to love your neighbor, they refer precisely to the dark, impenetrable abyss which is a neighbor. Beneath the neighbor, as my mirror image, the one who is like me, with whom I can empathize, there always lurks the unfathomable abyss of radical otherness, of someone about whom I ultimately do not know anything. Can I really know who he is? How can I be sure that his works are not a mere pretense? This is why Lacan applies to the neighbor the term think, the thing, the thing, used by Freud to designate the ultimate object of our desires in its intensity and impenetrability. One should hear in this term all the connotations of horror fiction. The neighbor is the evil thing which potentially lurks beneath every homely human face. Just think about Stephen King's Shining, in which the father, a modest failed writer, gradually turns into a killing beast who, with an evil grin, goes on to slaughter his entire family. This is a neighbor. Since a neighbor is prim primarily a thing, a traumatic intruder, someone whose different way of life, or rather way of enjoyment, disturbs us, throws the balance of our way of life, throws the balance of our way of life of the rails, when the neighbor comes too close, this can also give rise to an aggressive reaction aimed at getting rid of this disturbing intruder, as Peter Sloterdijk, with whom politically I disagree, but from time to time he says something penetrating. As Sloterdijk put it, more communication means at first, above all, more conflict. This is why, that's another thing, problem that I have with this. We should hear everybody's uh, his or their story from within and so on. This is why I don't think, I think this is a typical superego injunction. No, you should understand everybody. It's not possible. So then you feel guilty. You are never up to the level. No, I think that, how should I put it, very brutally, but I think this is the honest position. I don't want to understand everybody. I don't care about majority of the people. I think what we need today, when we are different cultures violently thrown together, I think we need, as Sloterdijk put it, a new code of discretion. We need more alienation. We need to learn to ignore each other. I don't think we need more to understand each other. This is, again, an impossible task, which makes us forever guilty. But did you really understand? How did you know what I meant with that smile and so on? We should, this is typical liberal blackmail, which we should, uh, which we should uh, reject. Perhaps the best way to describe the status of this uh, 
<coughs> sorry, <coughs> the status of this neighbor uh, would have been, uh, and this is, I think, there you see clearly politically the limit of this, let's understand the neighbor, would be the deadlock of that truth and reconciliation procedure in South Africa. Of course, I sympathize with it. But again, it has its limits. You know, the Wagler was a very honorable human one. Instead of engaging in revenge and so on, why don't we just offer to all apartheid torturers the chance of confronting their victims, openly describing what they did, and in this way, we guarantee them if they come and confess, they will be pardoned. The catch is that this procedure implies or rather only works when we can count, how to put it, on a minimum, minimal ethical responsibility and dignity of the torturer. What if what happens is what, according to my sources, did happen at least a couple of times, that you got an apartheid murderer who, torturer, who came there, confronted his black victims, and with a cynical smile said, yes, don't you remember, I tortured you in this way, in that way, I confess everything, okay, haha, ha, now I'm over. And he perfectly followed the rules, the problem was that this implication was not met, which is why, based on this, because the motto there in South Africa was, uh, we forgive, we don't uh, sorry, uh, uh, we forgive you, but we will not forget it. I think this is a very limited motto. I'm opposed to it. It's a fake. First, again, it has limits. It works only at a certain level. Would you be ready to say this for Hitler or Stalin? We forgive you, dear Hitler. Tell us the story of Holocaust. We will not forget it, but we forget. No, I think that when we are dealing with really radical crimes, I'm almost tempted to propose the opposite motto. I am ready to forget it, but I will never forgive you. This is, I was told in, in Korea, South Korea, how the people there spontaneously, a friend told me this, relate to Japanese crimes. I mean, they are still traumatized by what the Japanese did to Koreans under the occupation in uh, World War II and before. The treatment was so brutal, no, 10,000 of women forced into prostitution, not to speak about other things. The idea is it's so horrible that for our psychological sanity, we cannot afford to remember it, to think about it. So let's forget it, but we will never forgive you. I think this is a much more correct attitude when you are dealing, when you are dealing, uh, when you are dealing with a neighbor. So again, the first conclusion is that neighbor, in, in this sense of the abyss of otherness, which is simply the core of subjectivity, is, is uh, the limit to ethical universality, uh, which is why all these formulas of love your neighbor as yourself are an impossible demand. Underlying this love is always fear. The predominant way to maintain a distance towards these inhuman neighbors, intruding proximity, are customs, habits. What are habits? I would like here to repeat an old joke and maybe known to some of you and refer to the very important here in the United States philosophical debate, which took place some uh, four years ago in March 2003. The philosopher in question was Donald Rumsfeld. You remember when he engaged in that amateur philosophizing about the relationship between the known and the unknown. You remember, I quote him, there are known knowns, there are things we know that we know. The, it means very simply, like, I don't know, I am now in Boston and I know that I know this, clear. Then he went on, there are known unknowns, that is to say, there are things that we know we don't know. Also, it's clear, like, I know there are probably some cars in front of this building, but I don't know how many cars are there. But I know that I don't know this. Then <laughs> Rumsfeld went on, but there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we don't know we don't know. It's clear what he meant. That was his argument. It's not only weapons of mass destruction 
which we at least know that we don't know? What if Saddam even has some weapons about the existence of which we don't even absolutely know? So we don't even know what we don't know. There may be something totally unexpected there. But did you notice the, what's problematic here in his reasoning? That there is a fourth term which is missing. Known knowns, things we know that we know. Uh, known unknowns, things we know that we don't know. Unknown unknowns, things we don't know that we don't know even. And something is missing, which is the most interesting category. Not the, uh, not the known unknowns, but the unknown knowns. Not things that we know that we don't know, but things that we don't know that we know. And that's the Freudian unconscious. And that's why you are in trouble in Iraq, I claim. <laughs> because what the American politics didn't take into account is not some mystery there in Iraq or whatever, but the, to use this inappropriate name, the, the unconscious prejudices and so on, all these ideological prejudices, habits and so on, which determined the American politics and military activity without American soldiers and politicians even being aware of it. The problem was here, I think. The problem was not that you missed something, the CIA didn't do well, the analysis up there. The problem were all these prejudices, usually racist, cultural prejudices, political miscalculations, and so on and so on, which then brought the result in which we are. And these unknown knowns are located in habits. What are habits? I'm more and more convinced that habits are an extremely interesting dialectical category. They are not as simple as it appears. OK, we know that every community, in order to function from a, from a uh, university department to whole nations, needs some rules. People obey rules. However, I think these rules are never simple. It's never, these are the rules. If you obey them, you are in, otherwise you are out. The catch is that the, every rules, for structural reasons, which in Lacanian terms can be nicely explained as the inconsistency of the big other and so on, uh, every rules need meta rules, higher level rules, which tell you how to relate to explicit rules. The problem is that rules are never simply rules. We have often rules which explicitly prohibit something, but <clears throat> the message between the lines is solicitation. Like most of the sexual pro prohibitions work in this way. When father tells a son, don't mess with girls, it's basically do it, but discreetly. <laughs> Prove me that you are a man or whatever. And also many social rules are like this. I don't know when I was in the army and so on. It was always that often a prohibition was a direct call, violate the rule in a discreet way. But then, an even more interesting reversal is the opposite one, the opposite gap. When you don't have uh, explicit prohibition, which between the lines you are called to violate, but you are explicitly allowed to do something, but the message between the lines is you shouldn't do it. Like, you are given a certain freedom on condition that you do not use it. And I think this category is very useful in, for example, I will not be too long, my God, time is running. Let me give you a nice example. Soviet, ex-Soviet Union, Russia, was in deep crisis in the 90s, in the Yeltsin era. From what friends told me, the main problem was precisely the collapse of these implicit, unspoken rules. Like, in old Soviet Union, you knew where you stand. You knew what do you have to do when a policeman stops you. How much, how can you bribe him? You know when you should take authority seriously. You know when something was offered to you, like we live in free society, there is freedom of speech. You knew what this means, that you shouldn't do it. It was clear. And then in the Yeltsin years, it simply wasn't clear. This is what fascinated me in old socialist regimes, how these implicit rules covered everything. For example, in my country, ex-Yugoslavia, you, okay, there was free medical service. You wanted a quality operation done fast. It was exactly codified. 
for what type of operation, how much money, bribery, to what doctor, how much to the nurse, how much to the top doctor, and so on. The implicit rules were clear. Uh, the most elementary level of these habits is made, and this, I think, are rules at its purest, is made of so-called empty gestures, offers made or meant to be rejected. For example, a friend from Japan told me that in Japan, workers have the right to 40 days holiday every year. However, you are expected to use maximum half of this amount. So I, stupid as I am, I asked them, OK, why don't you simply put 20 days? They told me, you're an idiot. You don't understand it. And of course, they were right. They were, what do you, that's the mystery of rules. Why this type of exchange? Let me give you another example, which we have in our country, in my country, or in Europe. I don't know if you have it here. Let's say I compete with my friend for a job. I lose, he wins. It's considered polite for a friend to tell me, listen, I know you deserved it, really, so I will step down and you get the job. But of course, I'm expected to say no. Like, no, no, you have it, and so on. And that's the mystery of it. Although it's clear to both of us that he doesn't really mean it. It's, in a way, a sincere lie. We both know it's a fake, but it works. Sometimes you can even save a friendship. And I think that every procedure of, of, uh, of, of exchange, especially like apology, works like this. Let me, in the American style of talk shows, give you a confession. This happens to me with my good uh, theoretical enemy, personal friend, I hope I'm allowed to say this, Judith Butler. When we were uh, last summer together in some summer seminar, I, vulgar person as I am, I did something brutal. I used referring to her and to lesbians, uh, unnatural bitches, I even prefer to forget what kind of name. Then I noticed she was a little bit hurt. Okay, so <laughs> life is full of surprises. So, I called her immediately afterwards and told her, listen, I'm very sorry, you know, blah, blah, whatever. And she was very kind, of course. She said, listen, Slavoj, I know what person you are. Now, this was so nice, kind of. <laughs> and of course, I know you didn't mean it in any evil way, so please forget about it. You don't owe me an apology. Now, what's the catch here? You got the catch. The catch is that she was able to say, you don't owe me an apology only after I did offer an apology. And only in this way it worked. If I were to do what would have been logical and the way my evil mind works, I immediately wanted to do it. My idea was then to tell her, OK, if it's not needed, I take it back, the apology. No, no, it would have been impolite. On the other hand, if she were to say, oh, finally, you did apologize. Yeah, yeah, you were nasty. You should apologize. It would also not be correct. You get it? How something which logically, if you analyze it, it's meaningless. I offer something, I get it back as unnecessary. But in this very way, very paradoxical way, as superfluous, it's necessary. That's a symbolic gesture at its purest. This is what habits are about. But habits can be more complicated. The true mystery of habits is that uh, it's not only that something is prohibited, but that prohibition itself is prohibited, in the sense that it's prohibited to, how should I put it, to announce it publicly. Uh, I read this, the description of this scene in some book on, on, on Stalinism. It's a wonderful, simple example. Imagine a dream for me. We are now in Moscow, 36, 37, Central Committee, OK, I am Stalin. Uh, I give a speech. Then one of you stands up and criticizes me, attacks me. OK, everybody knows that. The next day, the question would be, who saw that guy the last? OK, but then imagine that another guy would stand up and attack the first guy who attacked me, Stalin, and would say, are you crazy? We don't attack Comrade Stalin in Soviet Union. Why are you doing this? I claim that this second guy would disappear even faster than the first guy. <laughs> that is to say, it wasn't only prohibited to criticize Stalin. It was even more prohibited to publicly announce this prohibition. 
This is the level at which customs function. And it inter it's interesting to me more and more the way this, all these functions, uh, namely this implicit, let's call it the implicit obscene underside of prohibitions which one shouldn't announce, of transgressions which remain implicit. For example, a very touchy example, problematic. Uh, the Catholic Church pedophilia. I claim it's, it's definitely this kind of uh, inherent transgression of the Catholic Church. You cannot say the way the Church is saying, okay, priests are humans like everybody else, of course some of them are pedophiliac, we, we cannot uh, control it and so on. No, I even know some examples from a journalist who did research in my own country in Slovenia that uh, of priests who, when they joined church where, how should I put it, straight heterosexuals. <laughs> this was the institution itself which made them pedophiliacs. So this is something, this is what interests me, how institutions have this kind of a secret collective unconscious, not in the Jungian sense, but in the sense of an implicit symbolic structure which is publicly disavowed, but nonetheless constitutes a, a disavowed constituent of their identity, which is why typically the church reacts to these cases in this ultra-protective way. Okay, so, and I think that these implicit rules, these unwritten, prohibited habits which control us, but they are prohibited to mention publicly, this is where change is the most difficult. For example, from my experience of the army when I served in 75, 76 in the Yugoslav army, this was my basic experience there. How, on the one hand, explicitly, the military community was extremely homophobic. If somebody was discovered to be homosexual, he was beaten every night, totally ignored, and so on and so on. But that's only one side of the story. The other side of the story is that unbelievable to what extent the entire army life was penetrated with homosexual innuendos. Like, for example, even to say hello in the morning, we didn't say hello. We say, I'll smoke yours or something like this. Like, <laughs> it was unbelievable. How the, this is what interested me, how, again, the explicit prohibition was sustained by a kind of a permanent reference to some kind of a thwarted implicit homosexuality. The difficult thing is to do, to change things here. That is to say, to change things at the level of what Lacan called the big other. And now I'm coming, if you allow me, uh, you're my super ego, Irena, a little bit more. Uh, the problem is the big other. That's the tragedy today. We conservatives are telling us we live in a godless era, blah, blah, blah. No, I think if anything, we believe more than ever, but we objectivize onto habits, onto the big other, our beliefs. What do I mean by this? What is the Lacanian big other? Of course, the most obvious figure of the big other is the big other in the sense of God, the guarantee of meaning, some big symbolic institution. Here, so that I will not say only bad things about Christianity, here I think Precisely every leftist materialist should fully appreciate the, uh, what in bombastic terms we call Judeo-Christian legacy, whose message I think is precisely, basically, there is no big other. In what sense do I mean this? I think the, the text, the first criticism of ideology, okay, is uh, the book of, how do you call it, the guy who was screwed up by God, Job, the book of Job. Uh, <laughs> What's so interesting? Why is this the first criticism of ideology? Remember what happens. Things look really bad for Job. He loses his wife, his goats, whatever, everything. And what happens then? Okay, it's a traumatic situation, loss. Then, do you remember? Three, I think there are three or four, three theological friends came, each of them explaining, trying to convince Job that his suffering, his misfortunes have a deeper meaning. That's the point. It's not so much that he is guilty. That's only the first theological friend says, God is just, so if you are suffering, even if you don't know what, you must have done something. Then others give more refined accounts, like maybe God is testing you, but the message is clear. You must have, 
This has a meaning. It's not just a contingent misfortune. And then comes the beauty. When at the end, you remember, God comes, his message is no. All that the three theological friends says is lie. Everything that you said is true. That is to say, God's answer is unbelievable. It's truly, as my favorite theologist, Gilbert Keith Chesterton said, God there becomes for a moment uh, a blasphemer and an atheist. God's defense is not, no, it looks to you that it's a meaningless catastrophe, but it has a deeper meaning. No, God, you know, when God then goes into this crazy rhetoric of, but what about, did you see how the sun rises? Did you see how when it rains, it can rain on a desert where nobody needs it and so on? God's message is you are nothing special. The whole universe is crazy like this. <laughs> it's as if God concedes that his own creation is somehow meaningless, doesn't have a cover in meaning, which is why I think we should effectively read Job as prefiguring Christ. Because I think to be brutal and to read the Bible, now I'm giving you a very condensed version of a longer theological argument, what dies on the cross is precisely this God which is the guarantee of a deeper meaning. Here I think Christianity has still a very <coughs> radical message. What do I mean by this? You know that disgusting, for me at least, metaphor of evil as a stain. Like if you look at the picture, if you look too close at the picture, you see only the stain. But if you look from a proper distance, you see how what appeared to you as a stain is effectively just an element which contributes to the global harmony. So the idea is what to our finite perspective appears as a stain, evil, really from the omnipotent, all-seeing divine gaze, for that gaze is part of a global harmony. Of course, now the problem is, can we really then say Holocaust, Gulag, or not just the usual suspects, for example, and this always shocks me. Here you can see the falsity of all this humanitarianism and so on. My God, everybody knows what is going on now. According to Time magazine cover story last summer, in the last 10 years, at least 5 million people died a natural death is in Congo. But they are not in, so nobody cares. So, okay, Congo, uh, Holocaust, Gulag, and so on. It's, are we ready to say, no, this appears only in our perspective because of our over proximity as a stain, but really in, it contributes to global meaning, beauty of the universe, and so on. I think that Christ marks the moment when you no longer can say this. The death of Christ means precisely the death of that God up there which guarantees meaning. Because what comes after Christ is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is simply the community of believers. The meaning of the death of Christ for me is there is no big other. I throw myself into the universe. It's up to you. As every deep theologist knows, the message of Christ is not trust God, but God trusts you. It's up to you, up to your freedom. It's a very materialist message, if you want. Okay, that's one aspect. But then there is the opposite aspect of the big other, which is much more interesting. The aspect of appearances. You know the classical joke, I used it three, four times, but now I will give a different twist to it. That famous joke about, you know, a man who thinks he's a grain, a seed, and, okay, is cured, but then goes out. Of, uh, is uh, dismissed from the psychiatric ward and then immediately comes back and says, I encountered a, a, a chicken. And the doctor tells him, but why are you afraid? You know now that you are not the seed and the chicken will not eat you. He says, okay, I know it, but does the chicken know it that I'm no longer? <laughs> okay, now <coughs> what I want to do now is to claim how this is a joke, but it depicts a very real uh, mechanism. A whole country fell apart so that the in order to protect the chicken's ignorance. It's Yugoslavia. Namely, what it's clear now from some memoirs that they published is that already in the uh, early mid 70s, it was clear to the inner circle nomenclatura that the country is in deep economic trouble. But Tito, lifelong president, was old and dying. So they made the collective decision that Tito should die happy. So 
they prolonged the false, uh, the false welfare by, by, in, by, by, by collecting incredible debts. In a couple of years, 15, for Yugoslavia, 15, more than 15 billions of dollars, so that the 70s went so, so relatively well. When Tito died, economic crisis did strike and so on. So you see, it's literally this logic. We know it, the chicken should not. The chicken should not get it. And I claim this is ultimately what culture is. It's not we don't know. It is as if for a gaze of some big other, there is always a chicken which shouldn't know it. This chicken can be a children. For example, how do you, let's say, you are one of the parents, you are fighting with your partner, blah, 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 blah. How do you measure the amount of your civilization? It's, if you are still able to say, but the, the child shouldn't know it. No, let's cover it, let's keep it secret from, from the child. Of course, the tragedy is that usually the child does know it, but pretends not to notice, not to hurt you, and so on. But the mystery is then that it works. This is, I mean, appearances are a big mystery here. Again, sorry for my old communist uh, obsessions, an incredible story about appearances from Soviet Union again. It's here you can see the theological dimension of Stalinism. In 53, in the summer, Beria, the secret police boss, was arrested. At that, and became a non-person. At that very point, the first volume of the new edition of Soviet Encyclopedia appeared, where ABC, Beria. There was a page on Beria in it. What happened? This was printed just before Beria's arrest, so Beria was celebrated as a great leader. What then happened after Beria's arrest was that every subscriber got one leaf of paper which fitted exactly that page, and he was ordered and we are talking about over 2 million subscribers. He was ordered to cut out that page and put in the new page, which uh, uh, re-established re perfect continuity. The previous entry went on, then instead of Beria, which was almost two pages, they replaced it with Bering Strait, you know, between Alaska, <laughs> with some photos and so on. So ask yourself a simple question. Whom were they trying to deceive? For whom were they trying to re-establish this continuity? As if, you know, nothing should be, the, the appearances should not be disturbed. Not for any empirical person. There was no empirical chicken who shouldn't know. The chicken was the big other, because every empirical person knew it, because he had to do it, to cut it out, put it in, and so on. Now that you will not say that I'm just making fun of Eastern Europe. You in the United States have the same, I know at least one wonderful example. You know, of course, Hitchcock's Vertigo. Remember the scene after Scotty saves Madeleine from uh, when she jumps into uh, the, the Golden Gate uh, by there beneath the bridge and takes her home, okay, undresses her, puts her into his bed, then you have in his living room a long panning shot showing him, then the camera passes the kitchen sink about which her underwear is drying up, and then the camera passes on, shows the door of the bedroom where she is. There is only one problem with this scene. Put, if you don't believe me, rent, or if you have the video, put the freeze on that very moment when you see the underwear above the kitchen sink. It's not underwear. They're just abstract pieces of cloth, like, like towels and so on. No underwear. You know what? I read in a book about vertigo. The reason is that these were the last years of Hayes Code censorship. They insisted that it shouldn't be underwear. Because if it's really underwear, it would have been a proof that Scotty saw her naked. This is not allowed, so it shouldn't be underwear. But it's the same mystery as with uh, Stalin and Beria. Now, whom were they trying to protect? Because we, viewers, we all automatically assume that we see underwear. There is, so in other words, uh, in other words, there is, there is a big other here. So if you allow me a little bit more, please. I, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I would like now to give you three examples. Okay, I will try to condense it a little bit. A couple of examples of how 
this defense against the traumatic, what happens when this protective screen of, of habits disintegrates? How do you protect yourself of the over proximity of the, of the neighbor? One interesting example here would have been pornography. I claim that the role of this stupid protective screen is there played by the stupidity of the story. Because the problem of pornography would have been, of course, hardcore pornography, the over proximity of the neighbor, intrusive. Which is why I think to block too much of identification, they do something which did always surprise me as incredibly vulgar. But I think there is a necessity in it. Did you notice, if you watch hardcore pornography, how incredibly stupid the story, the narrative is? which introduces the, as if, as if somehow it's the choice. You, you see it all, but the story should be openly ridiculous. Like, I don't know. I remember when I was young, I saw one which, you know, a plumber comes, fixes a hole in the sink, and then the housewife says, I have another hole to be fixed. It is <laughs> indescribable. Now, people are telling me, but today this is falling apart. You have this, especially French, Catherine Breillat, romance, and so on, films which try to combine really engaged melodrama with hardcore pornography. No, I think censorship did strike back with even stronger oppression. The latest fashion, I was told, is so-called gonzo, gonzo hardcore, which is what? Which is uh, kind of a, like, we we'll talk about embedded journalism, embedded... Uh, a hardcore, which means that actors don't even pretend that they are part of the story. They, with their comments, ironic grimaces, and so on, they directly address the camera. They don't pretend. And I think that this precisely is censorship. They fear that the proximity of the neighbor would have been too direct, and so on and so on. Okay, the next example, but I will skip it, I wanted to use here is, is torture. The way to deal, in order to deal with torture, we are now in the middle of the process where torture is being rehabilitated. How? There, the dimension of the neighbor should disappear. And finally, my royal example, as it were, would be that of antisemitism. Because if there is, in our Western tradition, one epitome of the disturbing neighbor, who is always too close and so on, it is the Jew. So let me make my position very clear here. Of course, I totally reject those leftists who think that because of the international situation, all the suffering of the Palestinians and so on, one should make compromises and tolerate a little bit of anti-Semitism. Like, one should understand them, you know. They're... No, I think that anti-Semitism is for me the zero-level ideology. You don't make compromises there, to put it quite metaphysically. It's always bad. But Something very strange is happening later. Uh, sorry, is happening recently. Uh, I think that we are witnessing a strange new mode of anti-Semitism. And before you start shouting, I will give you a proof, at least wait to the end of my argument, uh, Zionist anti-Semitism. Why? This idea came to me when I was in Israel with my friends, like my... Uh, 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 cinema maker Udi Aloni, we had a debate, and then he was ferociously attacked by hardline Zionists there. What did strike me is how the, the criticism reproduced all the usual cliché against the Jews in the West. The reproach was, you just pretend to be one of us, but you are really uprooted, you don't you are not solidary enough with the, with the state of Israel. You are really too cosmopolitic. You don't have roots. You are not identified with your community. You think only about, only about commercial success and so on and so on. In other words, what did shock me is how the, uh, the uh, Zionist critique of those Jews who do not solidarize fully with the state of Israel takes over precisely all the standard cliches, main cliches in the West against, against the Jews. If you don't believe me, do something. Go on the internet and look on the uh, www.masada2000.org slash list A. 
It's a Zionist website where you get the list of what they call self-hating Jews. It's a shocking document. Why? Because first, the term they used is something like a, a, a self-hating internal terrorist shit. Like, they call them shit. Point two, and you find there many of our friends, Judith Butler is there, of course, Avital Ronel, uh, 4,000. What shocked me is that uh, every person is described in an extremely aggressive way. The photo chosen is usually one that makes you look like a freak, ridiculous. And on the top of it, uh, wherever, they wherever they could have got it, you have an uh, email address, a solicitation to hate mail, of course. But the impression is really, my God, we are back at the like anti-Semitic, you know, the, the list of shitty Jews. It's precisely the same, the same logic. So again, here we have uh, the problem with the neighbor and so on. So if you allow me just three minutes more, I would like to conclude with a question which maybe bothers you. So does this mean we should just, in a kind of a Levinasian way, respect our neighbors, no universality, just let's keep a distance and so on? No. There is a positive universal ethics which does take into account this. What kind of ethics? Ethics, I would say, without morality. But this, I don't mean the Nietzschean point, when morality means how you relate to others and ethics means are you faithful to yourself, to your existential choice, and so on. I mean something else. For me, to use Schiller's opposition of naive and sentimental, morality is sentimental. You do something, but you feel good doing it, no? Like, you know, when you pay for charity for the African kids, you think, isn't it nice? There is a happy kid there because I sent him $10 a month, whatever. Ethics is much more ruthless. And I would like just to finish to give you a brief example. You find it in the bookstores, one of the defining novels for me, by a Hungarian writer, now an old lady who emigrated from... Uh, Sweet, from Hungary in 56, Agota Kristof. Agota Kristof. I like the name. It looks as if some stupid Eastern European mispronounced Agatha Christie, no? <laughs> she, wrote a she wrote a trilogy, The Notebook, The Proof, the, the Third Lie. It tells the story of two young boys, twins, living with their grandmother in a small Hungarian border town during the last years of the World War II and the early years of communism. These twins are absolutely immoral. They lie, blackmail, kill, but I think they stand for absolute ethics. Let me give you a couple of examples. One day they meet in a forest a starved deserter and bring him some things he asked them for. Then that's their narration. When we come back with the food and blanket, he, the deserter, says, you are very kind. We say, we weren't trying to be kind. We've brought you these things because you absolutely need them. That's all. I think this is a wonderful, truly Christian ethical stance. Uh, you just do what is needed. You don't do it because it's good. You do it because the other needs it, because it has to be done. And no matter what the other asks you. For example, one night, the twins find themselves sleeping in the same bed with a German officer, a tormented gay masochist. Early in the morning, the twins awaken and want to leave bed but the officer holds them back. Dialogue, don't move, keep, keep sleeping, says the officer. The boy said, we want to urinate, we have to go. Don't go, do it here. We ask, where? He says, on me, yes, don't be afraid, peace on my face, we do it. Then we go out into the garden because the bed is all wet. Like, totally cold normal, the guy wants to peace on his face, what's the problem, why not? <laughs> uh, this is the true work of love, I think. Then the twins' closest friend is the priest's housekeeper, a young voluptuous woman who washes them and their clothes, and plays erotic games with them and so on. Then something happens when a procession of starved Jews is led through the town on their way to the camp. One of the Jews asks them, please bread. The housekeeper, the young girl, shows a little bit of bread, then smiles and eats herself the bread. The boys decide to punish her. They stole from the German officer a little bit of munition and put her in, put into the kitchen stove so that her face explodes and disfigures her. It's considered a simple ethical act. I would have done absolutely the same. Then, the two brothers blackmail the good priest 
because they have a young girl who is harassed by the whole village, poor girl, and the girl needs help to survive. So what do they do? They go to the priest and said, we heard the story that you were once playing with a small girl. The priest said, it's not true. And the boy said, uh, we don't care, but the girl needs money, so if you don't give us so much money every week, we will tell this to the whole village. Then the priest said, I quote it, it's monstrous. Have you any idea what you are doing? The boys answer, yes, sir, we are blackmailing you. At your age, it's deplorable. The boys answer, yes, it's deplorable that we've been forced to do this. But Herlip, the girl, and her mother absolutely need money. I would do the same. There is nothing personal in this blackmail. Later, they even become close friends with the priest. And when the girl can survive on her own, learns to work and so on, they go to the priest and say, thanks very much, now we no longer need any money. They tell the priest, quote, keep it, you have given enough. We took your money when it was necessary. Now we are in enough money to give some to her lip, to the girl. We have also taught her, uh, taught her to work. And the same when the mother, the grandmother asked them to, to, uh, to uh, ask them to, to kill her, they kill her and so on. That's where I stand. If you would ask me what kind of ethics I would like to follow. It's precisely this, an ethical monster without empathy, doing simply the duty, the duty to help others with blind spontaneity, but without any narcissistic self-satisfaction. I claim that with more people like these two monstrous children, the world would have been a pleasant place to stay. It is only in such a world that we would be really alive. You know, the old religious question, is there life after death. Wolf Biermann, the German in the old days dissident poet, has a wonderful poem where he asks the true question. He says the true question is not, is there life after death, but is there life before death? And his answer is, okay, only in, with certain attitude and so on. And I think these two children with their ruthless, brutal ethics, you do it. It's needed, you blackmail the priest, it's needed, you kill, friend asks you to piss on his face, what's the problem, you do it. That's what I would like to be. Thanks very much. <laughs> now, yeah, now we can pretend now we can pretend that we are in a democracy, no, for, for some time. So we have uh, uh, approximately half an hour for questions. And so I would last, uh, like to ask everybody to make them as short as possible so that we can have as many people as possible asking the questions, okay? Thank you. Very enjoyable. <laughs> but, go but. To but, go to but directly. <laughs> no, I don't have a but. I have a question. Um, how, um, when you think about fundamentalism, is it big other? Or no. is it, it no? Almost the opposite. Opposite. Okay. Is this the question? Mm -hmm. Or you want to elaborate it? No, I want you to elaborate it, because uh, if you look at... Um, by fundamentalism, you mean what we usually mean by fundamentalism, so-called religious fundamentalism or what? That's only one of many, so I don't know. No, I'll leave it up Which to you. Which are the others for you? No, I just want to get the location of your question. Um, well, there's, there's fundamentalisms. I mean, there's, there's a kind of a secular fundamentalism that you saw in the 50s, maybe in Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, there's different ones. But I think people think about religious fundamentalism. Um, do you do you have a theory or an account of the rise of it in the 70s, uh, in, a, in the location of the, of mm. the West in a certain sense, or or why this yeah. time and not yeah. another mm -hmm. time? I just no, wondering what, what you think. What I about would this. have done first is, I, for the first thing here, I would apply my own theory the way I began to this. First, I I always 
try to ask, are these designations to be taken for what they are? I think that what people call fundamentalism often covers two very much opposed phenomena. I think that what we usually refer to as fundamentalism, you know, Pat Robertson, Jerry Falwell, they kind of, that, that kind of people, I would even deny to them the term fundamentalism. You know how I have a very naive, naive criterion of defending what I'm really tempted to even claim is authentic fundamentalism from this kind of fake fundamentalism. How do you relate? Is there envy or not? Let me be very naive. I don't have any illusions about Tibetan Buddhism. But Tibet, uh, Tibet, uh, Tibetan Buddhists that I've met, or Amish, again, I don't have illusions about Amish. According to some statistics, they have the highest rate of family incest, but they are authentic fundamental. You know what did strike me when I met them? They don't have this typical religious fake fundamentalism obsession with what the others, gays, are doing or what... They, they are very benevolent. They don't have this hatred this towards the others. They don't have the attitude of envy. They live in peace with others. I think the fake fundamentalism is this which is secretly, secretly fascinated by the sinful ways of the others and so on and so on. So my next criticism would have been that if you look at it closely, so-called fundamentalism, Pat Robertson, Falwell and their gang, Jimmy Swaggart, not to mention the really big ones and so on, but uh, isn't it that the way they deliver their message undermines the message? In the sense that all, the way they deliver their message is precisely an instance of what they criticize, a big ego trip and so on and so on. Now, a more difficult question. I totally also agree with you that this that it's a misnomer that this is not the only fundamentalism we have. I think even that the, uh, 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 the uh, you know, what surprised me were the violent reactions to, I don't think she's a great theoretician, but it's an interesting book, Naomi Klein's new book, Shock Therapy. What's the important, maybe, I'm not saying she's a great theoretician, but it surprised me how violent the reactions were to the book. Why? Because she touched an important point. How? Let's call it liberal economic fundamentalism. How? It is not ready to admit how, okay, we have markets, they work, but in order, they work, whatever, the, how, but in order for the markets to work, you need quite a lot of extra market violence. You know, it's not just, this is the big, maybe the biggest utopia of our time, I claim, it's the market utopia, which is why for me, it's not the official story goes like that. The 90s, I mean, 89, 90 is the end of utopias. Finally, we learn to renounce big utopias, uh, plans to reconstruct society, blah, blah. We learn to accept the lesser evil, no, and so on. But I think the true utopia were the 90s. The utopia, the Fukuyama utopia. And you know, it's easy to make fun of Fukuyama, that idiot who thought the end of history. But Basically, even most of my so-called leftist friends, we are all Fukuyamaists, de facto. Most of the leftists that I know, they silently accept the basic Fukuyama premise, which is capitalism, okay, capitalism with the human face and liberal democracy are the frame which we cannot overcome. All we can do is make it a little bit more tolerant, better, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, uh, uh, this is for me. Uh, this is for me the true fundamentalism. It doesn't take into account the extent to which the, the extent to which market, in order to function, and already there is a lot of violence, millions losing job, and so on and so on. There is a much more invisible, objective violence of the market. But even if we discount this. Market mechanism needs quite a lot of subjective violence. I mean, these are the big debates. For example, the well-known English of German origins philosopher uh, Ralf Darendorf called this the problem of the value of tears. Like, democracy functions after you have a certain level of development of economy. But to get to that point, you need 20 years at least of authoritarianism. 
dictatorship. He openly says this. He says, look at the third world countries, okay, third world, outside the Western Europe, which were, are economically successful, South Korea, Chile, and so on. His conclusion is they had to go through Pinochet or military dictatorship. But uh, the problem is deeper today for me. If there is a lesson to be learned from China today, it's that because typically those who have sympathies for this dictatorship, why don't they also support China then today? China is doing exactly this in a much larger amount. The irony is that I know, yeah, but yeah. the problem is the following one for me, because they have still this old liberal hope that China will get caught in the same dynamic when they still have this trust that after some 10, 20, that sooner or later, capitalism does bring with itself democracy, the way we understand it. I think the lesson of China and so-called Asian values, capitalism is not. I think that's the true danger today. I think that capitalism is entering a new stage where no longer democracy the way, even in this formal limited way, we use the democracy is needed. Democracy is needed. So in this sense, so that I don't get lost, in this sense, I totally agree with you about uh, 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 how the term fundamentalism first should be used we should be very clear how we use it, what we designate with it. We shouldn't limit it to this so-called hardline religious freaks or whatever. No, I mean, there is the, the basic fundamentalism today, I think it's precisely this liberal trust in the market mechanism in the sense of you just have to clear the space for market mechanisms to let it work, market mechanism, and the work will be done. The other problem that I see for me is that uh, the second distinction I would make is that the fundamentalists that I, I wrote about this in my last big book, uh, 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 Parallax View, what sur I spoke with some fundamentalists in this narrow sense. Really. What surprised me is that they are truly a threat to believe. No, not in this sense, authentic belief, but in a much more formal sense. I think their the way I understood them, their mystery is that they treat, their procedure is that they treat religious statements like Christ has arisen from the dead and so on as simple positive knowledge statements. Which is why, for example, let's take the Turing Shroud. I like these mysteries, you know, is it or not? Every genuine Catholic is horrified by the idea that it may be authentic. Because if it is, you immediately have very delicate problems. Like, okay, then we do the DNA test. And then the question, who is the father of Christ, becomes a very empirical question. And to be cynical, you would probably discover that some uh, probably Arab slave of the Joseph family you know, had something to do. I mean, you never know into what you get. No? But I spoke with some fundamentalists who are usually very pro-science. They say, nope, they even have theory. They say, God doesn't <laughs> have DNA, so it will be Mary's DNA redoubled, just two times the same and so on. <laughs> you know what I mean? The horrible thing is that for them, again, which is why true in this narrow sense, religious fundamentalists, they love, they don't have any problem with science. They, they, they simply, they basically, reduce religious statement to similar positive statements of science. And I think that in this way, even the true greatness of religious belief is lost. As every authentic religious person knows, belief is an existential wager. Belief is not belief in facts. Belief is always a decision. Like belief is that I say all people have the same dignity. And it's an, in a way a crazy thing. Because when I look at you, at you, uh, to put it in simple, rational terms, I can say, but I need more than you, you more, why should, I mean, this is a pure, this is a crazy decision which I accept. In, uh, there must be something crazy, absurd, in an authentic belief. So the paradoxical conclusion for me would have been that this kind of anti-Darwinian fundamentalist and so on, they are not a threat to science, they are a threat to authentic uh, religious belief. The third problem I have here is that 
What do we mean by belief today, more generally? I think that, uh, again, what I wanted, but I lost the thread, to develop a little, uh, one of the lines that I had to drop out. Like, <laughs> listen, for me, uh, even New York Times was kind enough to publish a text of mine, but now the story goes even later about that. I love the Chinese because it's madness. You remember that uh, two months ago, they passed a law regulating reincarnation, no? And I love this, that it's not a joke, like, you know, if you want to reincarnate there, you have to fill out a form where, how, and then I can even imagine, I have this evil imagination, how some bureaucrat in Beijing says, ah, you want to reincarnate as a llama? Sorry, all posts are taken. There are some insects free, some dogs there, make your choice. But, it's quite, but uh, now they're playing the game even further. I read a couple of days ago that now Dalai Lama, in reaction to this, because this law regulating uh, reincarnation, the whole point is to prevent Dalai, Dalai Lama choosing his successor. Now Dalai Lama <coughs> claimed that maybe he will not reincarnate, but he will organize something like the, the council uh, in Vatican, some kind of a parliament of all Buddhist figures, Tibetan, to democratically elect the next Dalai Lama. The irony is that the answer of Chinese government was, no, you are violating the tradition. <laughs> Dalai Lama should be reincarnated and so on, because they want to control it. My point is that it's too, de it's too easy to say that they are simply uh, that they are simply faking. We are back to that model that I used of a chicken, a chicken doesn't know. The mode of belief today for us is not that we directly believe, it's that we need to relate to another one, a child, or the, as for Stalin, it's the pure appearance. It's another who believes for us. That's our typical strategy today. You don't have to believe, but you need to know that the chicken doesn't know it, as it were, that we need a chicken. And uh, here, okay, to repeat an old joke, I use it in my book, here the formula of this belief was given perfectly by Niels Bohr, you know that wonderful story about Niels Bohr, who he had at the entrance of his country house a uh, horseshoe, superstitious object preventing blah, 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 evil spirits to enter the house, and he was asked uh, by a friend, scientist, why do you have this? Are you crazy? Do you believe in this? Neil Bohr said, of course, I don't believe it. But friend asked him, but why do you have it? He says, of course, I don't believe that horseshoe protects the house. But he said, but I have it there because I was told that it works even if you don't believe in it. <laughs> that's, how, that's how beliefs function today. We don't believe in it. We are very rational, cynical. But we nonetheless believe that it works even if you don't believe in it. And at this level, we are ultra fundamentalists. And this other belief, this transposed belief, this is the most difficult thing to accept. It's not for you to be an atheist. It's for you worrying, does my child know, or the, the innocent figure know? Their things are, this is where ideology is today. We have no illusions, but there is a chicken who has to have illusions for us. How should I put it, no? Okay, I'm sorry, I got lost a little bit, but that's that. <clears throat> Wonderful ending point, um, just because I was leading into my question. You give a great um, position on ethics, as it were, but I was wondering, where do you stand as for how we progress toward the future with dealing with ideology? You give a good criticism of the cynic in The Sublime Object, yeah, right? Yeah. But Not I was only wondering, there, I... what is the alternative in our now postmodern world? Uh, that's a good question, I will tell you. Uh, <sighs> Okay, I can only give you a very abstract number. I, I think that uh, the problem uh, I see is a political, but not in this superficial sense, to find a political form. The problem today is that we have on the one hand this, let's call it liberal individualism, whatever, and then these uh, uh, new forms of, or rather, return to old communities and so on. Is it possible to invent a new collectivity to overcome individualism without regressing into some kind of traditional community, to invent a new form of collective. And this, I think, is deeply political. It's why many thinkers, philosophers, to whom 
I feel very close, like from Alain Badiou to Giorgio Agamben and so on, are so focused on St. Paul. St. Paul is for them a political project of precisely community of believers, which is not a traditional community. It's not a traditional hierarchy, organic community. It's a based on universal truth community of believers. I mean, this is for me the this is for me the crucial question. Or to put it in another way, the problem is how to not accept what I referred to apropos the death of Christ, the fact that the big other doesn't exist, but not as sometimes, here I have problems with some Lacanians, Miller even, and others around him, who basically adopt this, this would be maybe an answer to you. Their view is that Psychoanalysis provides, to put it naively, the ultimate authentic insight. But it's just a momentary insight. You see, there is no big other void, whatever. But then life goes on, and you have to return to, to some kind of illusion. In other words, <coughs> in other words, the idea is that our social life is necessary illusory. And all you can do is get this momentary insight. I think if this is the case, then life is boring. <laughs> it, no? I think that uh, the whole point is, can nonetheless this, can the very fact that, as Lacan puts it, there is no big other and so on, can, does this mean that it's just a radical truth, you know, like Lacan develops apropos Antigone. Is truth just this momentary encounter? For a moment, you see it, you shouldn't look too long into the truth, then it renders you blind, then you must somehow return to the world of illusions. Or can we make truth operative in politics, in social life? Of course, my whole point would be, yes, we can. And I think more and more that, uh, how should I put it? OK, I will not develop it now. How about that? The, the whole development pushes into this direction, social development, in the sense of problems from ecology to other problems, they will push us in this direction. For example, ecology would be another mega example of what I said, ideology. On the one hand, it's absolutely a real problem, ecology. But I think that precisely because of this, ecology is one of the biggest fields of ideological investment today. I mean, I think there was a book written by an American, he's called Tim Morton, something like this. I'm sorry, I'm bad for names. With a wonderful title. I think the title of the book is already Ecology Without Nature. I think that should be our solution. I haven't heard of it, but... No, but it's a wonderful book. <laughs> no, what he means is not some kind of subjectivism. What he means is that uh, what we mean by nature, automatically, when we talk about ecology, the usual paradigm is there is some kind of homeost uh, some kind of a harmonious organic reproduction balance disturbed by human hubris and then we should reestablish the balance i think this very paradigm should be radically dropped if there is a lesson from radical darwinians like stephen jay gould and others it's precisely that there is no nature if by nature we understand this kind of a balance which was this nature is crazy in itself i mean Let's, what is our, our main source of energy? Oil. What is oil? Can we even imagine what kind of a mega catastrophe <laughs> had to occur on Earth so that there was oil? In other words, uh, I think that uh, this means that ecological crisis is even much more serious than we think. We cannot even rely. We have nowhere to withdraw. There is no balance to which we can return. The situation is totally open. And I like a certain crazy German ecologist who draw this radical conclusion and said that, that the goal of humanity should be not to reestablish any natural balance, but to violate nature even more. His idea is that nature left to itself would explode, render human life impossible. So since humanity can survive only in certain geographic weather and so on conditions, we should try and fix, freeze the earth. So we should be even more violent and so on. In other words, 
I think we should totally drop all reference to uh, all anti-scientific jargon, especially. You know, this is the usual ecological ideology. You know how uh, the source of ecological troubles is our over-exploitation, objectivization of nature. We act as if nature is out there, the object, as if we are not embedded in nature, breathing with it. So we should step out of technological attitude and live with nature. I think this is a problem, not a solution. The problem for me is the following one. We all know we are in deep sheet, warming, warming, whatever. The problem is, why don't we act? I think it's a perfect example of what in psychoanalysis is called the fetishist disavowal. I know very well, but. We know it very well, but. You hear a talk, you read a text about ecology, it convinces you, then you step out, you see there is sun, there are birds, rain, and you, precisely because we are embedded in it, wired into it, we cannot really accept that this can change. So I think paradoxically, we need more, more alienation from nature in the sense of we have to accept nature in its total contingency, madness. That's nature. Nature is not balance, paradise. Nature is, you know, something happens, small imbalance, and everything goes crazy. I mean, every natural balance is temporary, fragile, and so on and so on. Why am saying this, because this would be for me to bring it to the end, what Lacan says, the big other doesn't exist. To, uh, you know, usually people say either you are a subjectivist, self-responsible, and this means you are arrogant, absolute subject, or you defer to the higher authority. The difficult thing is to separate between these two, to accept that we are totally responsible, but nonetheless we are not absolute subjects. You know that the, the, it's a very difficult position to sustain, but I think we will be forced into it, as it were. I'm sorry. Okay, it was. I was. Too, you should be my super ego, my God. <laughs> you should be my to evoke the most noble example from American culture. You should be my Miss Bates. You know, from mother, from I mean, from psycho. Yes. Yeah, sorry. sorry, please. I will try to be shorter. I'm very sorry. Uh -huh. This is super ego. Why seven? Why not eight? Why not six? <laughs> okay, okay, sorry, please. Um, I'd just like to ask you about your idea of ethics and how it's similar or different to Richard Rorty's idea of ethics. Uh, because even when you said that helping when it's needed, it sounds like Rorty's idea of solidarity and Rorty's, particularly Rorty's idea of ethics without principles, like this deeply unrooted ethics uh -huh. that's highly contextual. So ah. it's not very absolute yeah, in yeah, that yeah, sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Perfect. I'd okay. just like to know what you think about that. Uh, that's a nice question. I'm so sad I don't have time. But uh, first, let me say, I greatly appreciated Rorty as a person. He was one of the few academics that I knew. Academics are usually very filthy, plotting against each other. He was one of the few persons that I knew that I can authentically say he was a good person. But I totally disagree. I disagree first with the, his underlying premise, which is, uh, that, uh, again, as you said, no positive universal values, but just this, his liberalism at its purest. Each of us, his story, basically, what makes us ethical subjects is our suffering and our right to tell about our suffering and so on. Uh, the best way to develop where I disagree with Rorty would have been with reference to Kant. Rorty opposes the private domain, as he calls it, embedded in philosophers like Derrida, Heidegger, who have these private fantasies, and then the boring Habermasians who have objective rules. For him, the point is the balance between these two dimensions. As he puts it, Heidegger and the wild guys are good. The moment you let them to gain power, you get mad. But I think that uh, what Rorty misses is the way Kant already uses in exactly the opposite way the distinction between public and private. Kant is here still my ideal. You know that for Kant, in his, I think, what is Enlightenment text, he there, for Kant, pub, what Kant calls private use of reason is precisely what Rorty would have called public. For Kant, when you work for a state, 
it's private use of reason. Why? Because it's not just the abstract space of intellectual debate, but it's part of the common good of a society. It's already part of its predestined whom you serve and so on. And for Kant, precisely when you subtract from your community and just talk in the free space of reason with others, individuals, this is the public use of reason. So the paradox, again, for Kant is that state is a private institution. But universities should be public, exempted from state. So this universal dimension is missing for me in Rorty. I'm, this is why I'm sorry that I didn't have time to develop it further, because the conclusion of what I said, it's definitely not some kind of uh, total idiosyncrasy. We are just this kind of terrible abysses of neighbor. We cannot come. No, no, no. I'm, I'm totally pro-universality. How should I put it? I believe in universality. I think that one of the greatest ontological errors, as it were, undermine uh, uh, sustaining this liberal multiculturalist ideology it's precisely this distrust of universality, as if every universality is ideological, imposed, and so on. I don't think this is the true problem today, this problem of there are minority voices here, there. We should open more and more the space so that all these voices should be heard, and so on. No, the problem today is not how to reach plurality, more plurality. The problem is precisely the opposite one. Unity, universality. So I'm very much pro-universality. So again, along these lines, I don't have time now to go into it. I think that uh, I think that one should definitely move beyond Rorty to a kind of a, un, without any shame, to a kind of a more aggressive universal project. The key problem is for me universality and truth, because Rorty basically plays this game of, you know, there is no truth, there are just stories that we are telling, and so on and so on. No, emphatically here, Rorty is a postmodernist. I am not. I believe in universal truth. But with all the Leninist paradoxes that truth is partial. Truth is not what unites us. Truth is division. Sorry. Uh. Yeah. Um. I was, at the end of your talk, you were discussing a, a morality without narcissism. And I've always seen certainly conventional morality as being inherently or de facto very narcissistic. Yeah. So can you just describe, first of all, is it possible to speak of a morality qualitatively without narcissism? And second of all, how would that work or what would it qualitatively That's a good like? question. Like, was I simply representing with this example two freaks or it works? Okay. All I can tell you is that very m I will take your question very sincerely and try to answer it naively. I mean, like, <clears throat> yes, I know some people with whom this works. That is to say, who effectively do things, and they are not naive in the sense that they don't reflect. They can reflect very cruelly and so on. But what I like is that there is simply a certain, a certain nor not narcissistic ruthlessness in what they are doing. There is none of this satisfaction. I do it because it feels so nice doing it. Now, here I have a slight disagreement with my good friend Irena, no, because uh, me, Lenin, would enter that, and you would have small problems here, no? Like, I, uh, sorry, a big problem. Okay, yeah, which is why, again, when I take power, you go to re-education camp. But since I am your friend, I will tell you how lucky your life would be. When you will be there in Siberia in a re-education camp, I will, call, I, as a, I will call the boss of the camp, and every Sunday you will get for free an additional plate of that shitty cabbage soup there, you know. <laughs> Isn't this nice? So it will not be so bad for you then. Sorry, please, but no, you see what I mean? I think, back to this, no, I think there are situations in, how should I put it, uh, struggle, struggling situation and so on, when this kind of collective can work, can work in a way. And I think that in a way, in a way, if you read authentically, I'm a total materialist, but this is for me where I write atheist Christian books, no? This is the way I appreciate Jesus. I mean, what, I mean, not 
uh, what Jesus? There was no Jesus, of course. What I mean is the figure there. It's that it's totally, how to put it, non-narcissistic in the sense that the way I see is that in Christianity you cannot say, you cannot have a blasphemy of Christianity because in a way Christianity is already its own blasphemy. My friend Terry Eagleton already develops how the whole logic of Jesus is the logic of, like, you know, the, this whole idea he is the king, of the, the king of the Jews. It's clearly that this is staged as a kind of a ridiculous carnival and so on. It's, it's, uh, so, uh, uh, how to put it? Uh, uh, it's, I think, totally, this is how one should read all these statements, Paulinian, about love and so on and so on. It's, it's totally non, it's totally non-narcissistic. It's not love in the sense of I love myself loving somebody. It's love without this dimension. And again, I think that it's not only freaky individuals who do it here and there. I think that there are from time to time collectives, like again, maybe some political collectives and so on, where this works. Okay, but it's, uh, no, thank you. Interrupting it now, thanks. And thank this you. high point. <laughs>